I'm reading the book by Laura Cumin, A Face to the World on Self Portraits. Chapter one, the title is、uh, Secrets. On a clear day, when the sunshine is bright, we cannot help glimpsing ourselves as spontaneous reflections. We vividly present in polished metal and glass, more provisional in opaque surfaces. The pianist becomes aware of his fingers echoed in the sheen above the keyboard. The caller sees his face in the mobile phone. The writer becomes a shadow in the computer screen when the glare gets too harsh. Coming between her thoughts and her words as maddeningly as those virtuous flags that drift across the optical field. One staring at a white sky, or during the prelude to a migraine, each is an involuntary manifestation of oneself. At home, we only have to draw a curtain to deaden our own image, but the wider world is not so conveniently adjusted. We spot ourselves large as life in the windows of shops. Tiny in wine glasses and spoons, in others' eyes and the lenses of their spectacles. Mainly, we ignore these inklings of ourselves, except when the object that contains them is big enough to be exploited as a face-checking device. But the truth is that nobody actually needs a mirror to see how they look. The daylight world is a sphere of endless reflections in which we are caught and hold over and again, and even at night, the curtainless window becomes a mirror when backed by after darkness, surrounded by these shining surfaces and the reflections they give back. There is no getting away from ourselves. Flemish painting loves this world of surfaces. It aims to do them to perfection, as if getting them exactly right was the guarantee of some higher truth than material reality. And this must have seemed the case nearly six hundred years ago, when this painter very suddenly began creating images of a God's universe so persuasive. To the eye, all the way from the broad rays of the sun to the macrocosmic fire inside a diamond, that contemporary viewers thought they could hardly have been made by human hand, a saint's golden cope and all the tinsel bright threads running through it, a carpet. And all its individual woolen staples, and then every thread in each. Surely this must be some kind of a God-given miracle, for such miniature couldn't possibly be rendered by an ordinary mortal with a paint brush. The old strain of incredulity rings true even today. Since one still marvels to see such immaculate illusions of life unfolding from the nearest dewdrop to the furthest range of mountains, and if a Flemish art aspires to a visibility that amazes, then the work of a Jean Van Eyck goes even further, rising to a kind of a godly omniscience. All you can see and more, as much of the world as can be gathered into the little compass of a, a painting, above, below, and beyond. Van Eyck developed a way of expanding the field of vision by using reflections to show what was just out of sight, as well as what was beyond the picture altogether. The entire skyline of a distant town reflected in the gleaming helmet of an archer, a offstage martyrdom in a heretic's breastplate. 
the armor will be super real. So like the thing itself has to baffle belief, the reflections will make the visible even more of the world. Make a visible even more of the world. When it comes to reality, Zhang Wan Ek is the supreme master. His art is so lifelike, it was once thought divine. But he does not in simply set life before us as it is, an uh, enduring objection to realism, that it is no more than mindless copying. He adjusts it little by little to inspire all at the infinite variety of the world and our existence within it. The astonishing fact that it contains not just all this, but each of our separate selves. What is more, one egg makes this point in person, and not once, but several times, with a humility that amounts to a trait. Yet, experts barely seem to notice the human aspects of these incidental appearances. Oh, the startling solo portrait he left of himself. For arguing about whether they can be deemed self-portraits in the first place, this is one of the disadvantages of being a pioneer. One egg is too early to assimilate, because there is no flourishing tradition of a self-portraiture in Europe yet. He is not allowed to be painting himself. Clearly, there must have been great self-portraits before him when one considers how much art of the period is lost. Some estimated that only a quarter of a Renaissance art survives. But even quite a serious art, historians seem to imagine that nobody could produce a sophisticated self-portrait without a sophisticated mirror. Or that nobody had a self before its supposed invention later in the Renaissance, and that Van Eck is only fooling about with the figments. But his art argues against such primitive and arrogant notions, and does so with characteristic grace. Look at the way that Van Eck finances his own image into a great altarpiece such as the Madonna and the Child of Canaan, Wonder Pale. By way of drawing attention to the effect that anyone who looks at a bit of a fiercely polished metal, no matter how gray the day, is pretty much bound to see himself. The Madonna and the Child are sitting in a space so cramped there is hardly room for their visitors. Sent donation on the left in a blue and gold cope. Sent George on the right in a cacophonous suit of a bronze armor. George is a bumptious figure, disturbing the pace, disturbing the peace, and trading clumsily on the vestments of the old cleric kneeling beside him namely Canon Van de Pelle, who has commissioned the picture and is even now being introduced to the Virgin. The point of the picture ought to be the relationship between these four large adults, but there are so many other pressing attractions. The heavy eyeglasses in the Canon's hand, the circular ventricles of the windows, the individual design of every single checkboard tile, above all the super stupendous, uh, stupendous patterned carpet that begins beneath the virgin, falls its way down the ceremonial steps and stretches right out of the picture as if to meet the viewer's own feet, a sensation fully underwritten by the staggering depiction of this woven stuff, too thick to make perfect right angle bends down each step. It's a view stiffening here, flattening there, casting the tiniest of shadows 
within in each own texture, infinitesimal, infinitesimal. One egg seems to have started out as a miniaturist, and part of his achievement is to sustain that technique on a larger scale, without any loss of、uh, effect, so that his picture never disintegrate into smaller catalog of a detail. You can be densely absorbed in that carpet without losing your sense. Of the circulation of air, the passage of light on the reflections that keep the piece fluttering alive. Saint George doffs a helmet, ribbed like a, a conch, is a volute, reflecting the mother and the child over the again, over and again, the entire scene. From the red granite column behind him, to the old northern light of the window, is、uh, repeated in his、uh, breastplate and shield. But there is one reflection that has no identifiable source in the picture, because the original stands outside it, a tiny figure in a red turban. One arm raised to apply a brush stroke. To describe this self-portrait as a modest would be an understatement. It is not even the size of a, a match. Only in a reproduction fully as large as the painting itself, approximately six feet by four, would anyone be able to see it in a contest. The hiding place is what gives away, as well as the pose, for to be reflected in the sense angled, shield, at this size, the man in the turban would have to be standing back from the picture, near the center, approximately where we stand to look, and what did the artist see when he stood there? Not the armor, of course. But the wet oil paint itself, in which working clothes, he must have been hazily reflected. Let me stop here to make a a bit of comment. So far, what、uh, the writer is saying that、uh, for in this、uh, picture, this painting of、uh, the great、uh, painter, Flemish painter, uh, Van Eyck, uh, Van Eyck.、Uh, Paint himself in a very small plate on the armor.、Uh, there's a picture here, but right now actually,、uh, I can't. I cannot tell you where it is. You have to find it yourself.、Uh, the the painting's name is called is called Madonna and the Child with、uh, Canon George Van der Pel, fourteen thirty six. Jean Van Eyck. Lives、uh, from、uh, 1390 to 1441. The details actually is in the very、uh, small place, so it will be hard for you. But if you look at it carefully, you will be able to find it. It's very small. Maybe you should find a, a very detailed painting of this. Okay, let me continue. The conceit is that the armor has he has painted is so sparklingly real. One egg can see himself in it,、um, and perhaps there was an actual suit of armor in the workshop, a material object to summon in all its hard glory, but there were. No sense and canon when the pale clearly never met Mary. The artist is making up his world. There is、uh, the fictional scene: the wily old canon sucking up to the mother of God, and there is a miraculous illusion of a reality that abets it. Between the two, slipped into the surface of the picture. 
is a reflection of the truth and the reality outside it, the painter's side of the story. When I read it, of course, there are some words I don't even know、uh, clearly, or I cannot、uh, pronounce it very clearly. So it may be difficult for the audience to、um, know what I'm talking about. Uh, but only a few words of them.、Uh, hopefully, that will be not too bad. Let me continue. Zhang Wan Eck was、uh, probably born in 1390, possibly in Maastricht. Maastricht. He worked mainly in Brugge as a court painter to Philip, Duke of、uh, Burgundy, who sent him. On at least two ambassadorial mission by sea voyages, so weather pitched the ships were forced to dock in England for safety. First, he painted Isabella of Spain as a potential bride for the Duke, and then he painted Isabella of Portugal. Neither portrait survives, but the Portuguese Isabella won the contest. I don't quite understand this one. It just says、uh, when Eck painted two、uh, paintings of uh, uh, Isabella, but、uh, here it says about the Portuguese Isabella won the contest. What does that mean? I'm not sure. Philip treasured when Eck's friendship as well as his art, giving him vast bonuses and expensive gifts, becoming godfather to his daughter. And supporting his widow, that he pressed their conversation is apparent from an afterage letter to some of the painter's clients, who were withholding payments, an insult that the duke takes personally, declaring he will never find a mind equal to one ex liking, nor so outstanding in his art and science, not just art. But science as well, meaning knowledge of、uh, mathematics, optics, astronomy, geometry, all the learning that enriched one X painting, and no doubt his table talk, but possibly something else too, the invention of oil painting, him itself. According to Wasari, teller of tall tales, one X one day. Took a, a most painstaking piece of work out into the sunshine to dry. When he returned, the varnish had cracked, and the wooden panel was、uh, splitting. Infuriated, but being a man who delighted in alchemy, Van Eyck experimented with、uh, numerous conco- concoctions of eggs and oil, until he hit upon a secret formula of a lice. Seed, lime seed, and、uh, nut oil, mixed with the ground pigment. That was not only heat proof, but waterproof too, and which brought a beautiful new luster to his colors. Out of a base substances, one egg supposedly transmutes the precious stuff that all the painters of the world. Had so long desired. Oil painting existed before him, of course, but most artists were still working with、uh, tempera or gesso, mixing their pigments with egg white or damp plaster, and getting stuck with their quick drying effects. Oil paint gives depth and luminosity and reflects light from within. Layer by translucent layer, fluid and lingeringly slow to dry, it allows for infinite variations of hue, tone, and consistency, and the sublist of blinds and transitions. One act exploded all these properties to the fullest degree, as no other painter before him, inventing not so much a. Technique, 
as an entire tradition of a painting. His own picture looks his own pictures look as if they were never quite dried. They are surfaces shining with liquid light, like the very substance of which they are made. Had he lived in the late twentieth century, one act might even have painted a stunning, stunning picture of oil paint itself. The texture and the gleam of it on a palette. Another wonder of the world, and working so intensively with the palette, and so close up to the surface of each panel, he must have glimpsed himself in the oil, not exactly a face, just an imprecise blur in whatever he was painting. As long as the sun shines, there is no getting away from ourselves. Does this painted reflection amount to a self-portrait? It is too small to be much of a likeness. This indirect glimpse, and for some its size irresistibly reduces it to a joke, more playful than profound, comments one art historian. With a touch of a patronizing indulgence, arguing that the artist does not show himself so much as his character. It is true that one could hardly extrapolate a recognizable likeness from the fact, and yet something more than character is surely represented in this little self-portrait. Not at all. According to other experts, for this is not one act, lay people may want, to, want it to be a self-portrait but they only see what they want to see, and there is no textual evidence to support the claim. Written evidence trumps virtual evidence for art historians even more than for layer, lawyers. Without documentary support, such identifications are purely subjective. Of course, the case could be argued in terms, in terms of a custom and practice. Artists often appear at the back, in the margins, or among the cross in Renaissance painting, pointing at themselves. It was me, I painted this, and sometimes even gesturing at their painting hand. I made the whole thing with this. Some go even further, putting a name to the face. Bonozzo Gozzoli included himself among the throng of uh, Medici godfathers and the hangers-on, wending their way down a valley on a horseback in his uh, procession of the Maggi for the Medici chapel in Florence. He wears a scarlet hat with the words Opus Bonotti lettered in gold round the brim, a pun on his name. Benotti, well noted, which was also something of self-fulfilling prophecy, since he, this is uh, practically the only name not not, uh, not not lost. The caption beneath Pietro Prugino's pretend portrait of himself hanging from its trompoloi chain among the frescoes of the Collegio del Cambio in Prugia declares that if the art of a painting had never existed, then Perugino would have invented. Though since he lavished more care on himself than anyone else, the self-portrait could almost be Flemish. No one could be fooled by this third-person rhetoric. It is traditional to regard such self-portraits as elaborate signature or advertisements, instances of attention-seeking painters asking to be elevated to some higher status than anonymous craftsmen. Though even Gosoli and Progino show more conceptual weight than such narrow interpretations allow, 
but the one egg presents problems for experts. Unlike either of the Italians, he did not support this or any other self-portrait with written certification. So there are supposedly no self-portraits by Jean Wan Eck because no one can be substantiated. Or there might be one, or they are all just a stake man in a running gag. If one egg paints a reflection of himself in a pearl, he is seemingly celebrating the, the shyness of the world, not alluding to his own place within it. If he paints a reflection of a man in a turban in an orphany portrait, it's just another way of assigning the work, right at the outside, the depth and the complexity of self-portraiture are clearly being denied. But it is not romantic to call these reflections self-portraits. It is a mark of respect. One X art teaches the eye to see the world on an infinitesimally small scale, and it hardly belittles picture or painter to suggest that the miniature figure in a armor expresses self-consciousness in its maker, a figure in the visible world. What weight, moreover, to clinch this extraordinary illusion of uh, reality with a reflection that introduces the here and the now right into the picture, as if the real and the painted worlds were continuous, while at the same time jamming that illusion with a reminder of the artifice involved in the pictures, making personified in the image of its maker. This caught the possibility of a self-portrait, and you deny one act all of these marvelous possibilities. Put simply, you refuse to allow that he could be such an intelligent painter. Appearances are everything in one X art, and his art is devoted to making them real. Most representational painters leave something to the viewer, requiring us to imagine or deduce some parts of the picture. But one X does the opposite. His paintings are stupend stupendously complete, not a hair out of place. Yet, it is precisely this fullness of reality that Michelangelo dismissed in the early objection to the realism of the Flemish school. He said, the painted stuff and missionary, the green grass of the fields, the shadow of trees and the rivers and bridges, and all this, though it pleases some persons, is done without reason or art. Without reason, without art, look at another painting by Van Eck, in which the Madonna and the child are foolhardy enough to grant an audience to the Duke of uh, Burgundy's intimidating chancellor. Roland is a big man with a savage haircut and a look of a brute cunning, much like the enforcer he was in real life. The Madonna appears to be drawing cautiously back, but the child on her knee is blessing the politician, exactly what Roland had paid for. Behind the lavish chamber in which they sit, a whole world unfolds through the windows, green fields, rivers, the shadows of trees and bridges, a sparkling city and beyond it brighter vistas yet. Even those landscape, which seems to extend over 50 miles, retain the same degree of solidity, so solidity and the same fullness of a articulation as the very nearest objects, wrote the art historian Irvin Panofsky in a famous passage of a praise. 
Jan's eyes operate as a microscope and a telescope at the same time. And all this reality, the palace garden and every leaf of it, the meadows and every blade of them, to the furthermost glittering pinnacles, is a paradise on earth. The landscape of the New Jerusalem. Between this world and the next, near and far, two little figures are posted like vultures on a paramonetary. One is studying the view from the palace battlements. The other turns slightly, glancing back in our directions. He wears a red turban and carries the rod of a, a courtier. The crucial fact about this figure is once again its position on the threshold between two worlds, present and future. The, and right at the epicenter of the painting, draw the diagonals and they would meet on a point, the hand of the man in the turban. The angel in the Jerusalem, the angel in the New Jerusalem, according to Revelation, has a rod to measure the glorious architecture of the city. The measurement of 1x New Jerusalem are exceptionally small. The whole picture is only about two feet wide, and his rod is thus sensationally tiny, a microscopic yardstick for a miniature vision. But even without the biblical aside, and one X paintings are always theologically rich. The little man in his eye-catching turban has uh, a modest humor all of his own, discreet enough to escape Rowling's self-centered attentions. You feel, but there for those who have eyes to see him. One act places himself at the crosshairs of his own field of vision, painting the world and all its contents. He numbers himself within it. This is a not narcissism, but a modest logic. Even without a mirror or reflections, we are visible to ourselves somewhat. Shut one eye, and the projecting nose becomes apparent. Look up and see the overhanging brow. We have an after as well a inner sense of our own bodies that reflections confirm and confound. And catching sight of these reflections, we are made episodically conscious of our own bodily existence, atoms in time, maybe, but nevertheless the viewing center of our world. It has been argued that the only reason anyone ever imagines these little men in red turbans might be one act is because um, of another painting by him known as Man in Red Turban, or at least that was its title until very recently when visual evidence was finally allowed to outweigh academic caution just a fraction and scholars relabeled it portrait of a man, maybe self-portrait. In fact, there is a faint long-nosed resemblance between this man and the courtier with his rod that has nothing to do with the turbans, and the turbans are in any case off the point. One egg stares piercingly out of the picture, a tight-lipped man with a fine silver stubble. His look is shrewd, imperturbable, serious. The eyes are a little watery, as if stained, as if strained by too much close looking, and there is a palpable melancholy to the picture. Look closely, as one X art irresistibly proposes, and you notice something else, that the eyes are not in equal focus. The left eye is painted in perfect register, 
and so clearly that the northern light from the window glints miniaturely in the wet of it, the world reflected. But the other is slightly blurred, you might say impressionistic. These eyes are trying to see themselves, have the look of trying to see themselves in some kind of a mirror. Zhang Wan X made me is written below the image. Along the top runs the inscription, else each can, as I can, and that poundingly as I can. One egg painted the else each can motto on the frame of other portraits too, but it is far more emphatically displayed here to create the illusion that has been carved into the gilded wood itself. It also appears where he normally names the sitter, but more than that, is play upon the first and third person epitomizes the I-He grammar of self-portraiture to perfection. Here I am, gravely scrutinizing my face in the mirror and the picture. There he is, the man in the painting. I'm here, he was there. Zhang Wan X Fu Hick is written in a exquisite exquisite chancery hand on the back wall of the Anophony portrait. Ever since uh, Killer Roy was here and everywhere in the 20th century, the phrase has epitomized the graffiti, which is in its uh, elag uh, sorry, which is in its elegant way exactly how Wan Eck uses it. Everyone knows the anophony, anophony, the rich couple with the dog, the orange of the mirror and the shoes, touching hands in a expensively decorated bedroom. But nobody knows quite what they are doing there, in a bedroom of all places, an intimacy unheard of in Flemish portraiture. This drawing of hands is it the moment of a betrothal, the marriage itself, and the party afterwards? Oh, nothing to do with the wedding. The bed awaits with its heavy scarlet drapes. The dog hovers. The texture of its fur is quietly summoned all the way from coarse to whisper soft. Perhaps. He is a em emblem of a fidelity. Perhaps this is a merger between two Italian families trading in luxury goods, as lately suggested. But all interpretations are necessarily reductive, for none can fully account for the strange complexities of the painting. Even if one knew precisely why Giovanni Anofini was raising his right hand as if to testify he would still be a peculiarly disturbing presence with his uh, reptilian mask and the lashless eyes, dwarfed beneath a cauldron of a hat. He touches but does not look at the woman. She struggles to hold up the copious yardage of a dress that nobody could possibly walk in. Behind them is what writing on the wall that makes so much of the historical moment, and beneath that is the legendary mirror in which one egg, one egg is reflected in blue entering into the scene. Zhang Wan Eck was here. It is not strictly accurate in terms of tense, of course, for one egg has to be here right now as he paints his story on the wall. He sends a message to the future about the past, but it is written 
in the present moment. The paradox is、uh, its own little joke, as for every Kilroy, but the mirror also tinkers with the tense of the picture. Without it, you would simply be looking at an image of the past, a time-stopped world of wooden shoes, abundant rubs, and a sign language too archaic to decode. But things are still happening in the mirror. A man is on the verge of、uh, entering. Life continues on our side, the painter's side of this room. For Van Eyck invented something else too, not just a new way of painting, but the whole idea of an open-ended picture that extends into our world and vice versa. Just as his reflection passes over the threshold to enter the room where the Anophany stand. So he creates the illusion that we may accompany him there as well. The tiny self-portrait is the key to the door. Art need not be closed. The inscription in the Anophany portrait announces the artist's role as witness and narrator. I was here. This was the occasion, though the self-portrait says something more about the reality depicted. The liquid highlights in the eyes, the pucker of orange peel, the flecked coat of a dog, the embrasure of a clear light, reflected again in a brass-framed mirror. The whole powerfully real illusion was、uh, contrived by Jean Van Eyck. Transforming what he saw into what you know, you now see here. He is there in the picture, connecting our world to theirs. A pioneer breaking down frontiers. As usual, the painter makes no spectacle of himself. One X self portraits are conceivably the smallest in art, certainly the most discreet. Yet their skill. Is in inverse ratio to their metaphysical range. The visible world appears to be outside us, viewed through the windows of the eyes, and yet it contains us all. That's the end of the first chapter. Mostly, it's about this Flemish painter, Jean Van Eyck.